Honey Mafrica bought the property and studio from Leslie Thompson and expanded it into its current state. He's currently in an assisted living situation and these are samples of what I consider his best body of work. He made the pots and a well-known calligrapher in Santa Barbara, Nabo Yamamoto, decorated them, did the calligraphy. She's since deceased. The way you can tell you're here is the pots up on the top of the posts here by the gate. And these two Buddha scene paintings that are here, these were done by John Aaron and put up here a number of years ago. John Aaron's also an accomplished potter. He did these sculptural dioramas. And when the AME church massacre happened, he did uh, this commission piece in memoriam of the massacre that happened there. Come up toward the house, toward the studio. the side of the house. And as you can see, the studio is back behind the house. And the first thing we're going to come up into is the glaze area. We saw Sherman there having a rest. Where the glazing area includes these two tables, which are also used for hand building. That table over there. This little table here. And the buckets of glaze. In the corner over there, you see a banding wheel, large banding wheel, and uh, a spray set up. Pretty funky looking, but it works. All right, so the first thing I do is I bring all the bisque pots out here and lay them out on these two tables. Then I start dividing them into glaze groups. So pots are getting a single glaze. I put those together <coughs> by glaze. Pots are getting multiple glazes. I put them together by uh, base glaze. And then if there's a subdivision between the base glaze and Overglaze, I split those up too so that I, I can just focus on um, one glaze at a time. So these pots over here, the uh, three pots to the right have been glazed. Uh, there's two layers there, and then the rest are waiting to be glazed. These are waiting to be glazed with the exception of Again, the two pots in the front to the right have an underglaze that was poured on them, and they're gonna get a, an overglaze sprayed. These pots on that table have all got two layers of glaze, an underglaze that's a yellow-brown, and the overglaze is different blue, so depending on how they were sprayed, you can see the patterns. Spray patterns and some uh, tree stuff. Uh, there's this <coughs> spray gun hanging out with the extruder my little compressor. So I worked a couple places with really big noisy compressors. This is actually plenty. I think it was under 200 bucks and uh, it's quiet, which is nice for me and the neighbors. Normally I set the glazes up here that I'm working with <coughs> to blend them and get them ready to pour or spray and a bucket with 
water and sponges for wiping bottoms and other messes. Here's something. <clears throat> so the wax that I use on the bottom of pots is not a thick emulsion wax. It's actually a stone sealer and it's thin instead of thick and I put on two coats put on one coat it dry soaks right in put on another coat and it uh, resists the glazes perfect for bottoms without a lot of mess um, I use the green wax emulsified wax for wax resist but I use this on the bottoms of pots Let's see what else here. So that these, this is an old um, enameled butter warmer. I actually got from Etsy. I used to have about a dozen of these back in the day. They don't make them anymore. Found them on Etsy. The ones I found were all made in Poland, secondhand. But I use these. <clears throat> I use this as a pourer, like to scoop and pour the glaze. It holds a decent amount and I like the handle and I like that it's got a spout which lets me you know, control the flow of the glaze being poured better than uh, better than other things I've played with. Tongs which I hardly ever use. Someone was here earlier today using the tongs and that's about it for the basics. Um, Okay, I'm going to set up a tripod and do some glazing and capture that. Okay, I'm going to glaze these couple pots with a clear glaze. And it's actually an experimental clear. It's a glaze that I've used, the base glaze that I've used with... Uh, cobalt in it, but I'm going to try it here just by itself as the base. It's a simple glaze. It's just um, uh, <laughs> Gersley borate or culminite and feldspar. I don't remember the exact percentage, something like 70 to 75% feldspar, I think. And the rest scarcely borate. It's thick, too thick. Need some water. wrong can't get all the all the lumps out so I'm gonna go get a whisk couldn't find a whisk so I'm use a little wand blender <laughs> Awesome for that, for glaze tests, cone six, you know, pints or quarts of glaze. Okay, so I'm gonna pour these. Let's see, thickness. This is marble, three different. 
clay colors. Just wiping down the thicker uh, glaze trails. And this is a, it's actually real red clay with porcelain on it. And so what I'm curious about is a clear glaze over an iron laden clay <clears throat> in reduction typically shows some uh, darker, lighter gray. So I want to know what the, combi what the contrast, the combination here of the white porcelain and the gray is going to be. So a test pot. Again, take the high spots off of the drips. Tiny bit off the rim, because that's gonna get covered again when I pour it from the outside. Normally I have this little group of sponges wrung out and just sitting here on the table waiting for me to grab as I need them. Okay, outside of this one. touch the table as I set that down, so I have to patch the glaze on that spot. That one's not quite, not quite ready. So. Side of this one. This foot was waxed. it for this glaze. Let's have a bucket over here that I use for cleaning off the grill when that's used and for cleaning off uh, any pouring containers.
And then a few years back, a friend here in Ohio showed me this trick, which I'd never dawned on me before. I'd always use just my hand or the spatula, but to use a sponge wiping this out because you can just squeeze a lot of the glaze back into the bucket, losing less. I'm going to get reset up for spraying. Okay, I'm going to get some pots ready for spraying. And the first thing is for things like vases, I need to glaze the inside. seen these this kind of uh, paddle for mixing paint or glaze awesome plastic flat bottom cleans off the bottom of your bucket because it's plastic it doesn't scratch up the inside of the plastic bucket love it okay so we're gonna do the insides of these pots this in a different clays. And after I pour the glaze out, I'm wiping some of the glaze off of the rim so that it's not quite so thick after uh, the glaze is done on the outside of the pot. These I did the inside of yesterday. Clays here range from porcelain to 
do Black Mountain, Porcelain, Rio Red, um, It's actually a white stone where I'm not remembering the name of it right now. Anyway, that's the range of the clays. This clays that I use porcelain, the white stoneware, red stoneware, and the black stoneware. Okay, I'm going to reset the location of the camera now to spray. Okay, spray gun. Here's the spray gun that I use. It's from Harbor Freight. It's about 30 bucks. And I actually like the way this sprays better than the 80 or $85 ones that I've had in the past. I like the spray pattern on this one better. But it's a cheaper gun. They last me about a year until some of the bear bushings and you know, the things that seal it up um, wear out. Like, I don't know if you can hear this now, it's leaking air a little bit. So it's just, it's at that point that it leaks. It's probably got another three months maybe of life until it's just, uh, it just won't, it'll just always be, <laughs> be leaking glaze. Okay. I don't know if you can hear when the compressor's on. So normally I do this over the um, normally I do this over the glaze bucket. So I'm gonna do some of this here. So uh, I fill this up about three quarters. Put the lid on, test it. Make sure that it's spraying. I don't know if they've ever used a spray gun, but there's a dial here that adjusts the shape of the spray out of the nozzle. If it's all the way down here, it sprays round. As it goes this way, it gets narrower and taller. So I use it at different places at, for different uh, effects. And you can see it's leaking. There's where it's leaking. It'll get to the point where it's just pouring out of there and it's time to get another one. Start with a couple bowls. Put something up here to hold these larger bowls off of the turntable. And there we go. So I'm giving it a base coat of. Well, I can tell it's coated. I'm paying attention to what's here on the wax, and um, I can see it building up. It's probably hard to see in the in the video, white clays on white clay. And now I'm gonna change the size of the spray. And add some more glaze here. showed you the um, the extruder that was hanging over the, the open extruder is a perfect place for me to set the spray gun in between using it it hangs it just hangs inside of that open uh, tube really nicely Side. 
same thing. An overall thin coat. It's actually more like a medium coat. You can see the spray gun dripping, I'm sure. And then I get down to a little larger droplets. I'm walking out of the frame there. I'm headed over to the water. Water bucket. And then I take a look again. The foot. So that one's done. That's the base coat. That's done. Okay, I'll do a couple of bases here. back into the blaze. You know, it's not a lot, but it puts a couple tablespoons of blaze back in the bucket. It adds up. the base layer. And it's spiraling up the side of the pot. The top, spiraling back down. Somewhere between two to three layers of this place. This place is a little thinner than I usually uh, have at this frame. Okay, it's the next day, and I'm ready to put the second color on those pots I did yesterday. So where I am is uh, these pots are glazed. Second color on them. There's a little group back there that as I was going, I started out to put a different base glaze on. And then over here are the pots um, waiting. So it was those two bowls in the back, the two bases on the left, I put a test glaze on the front vase on the left, so I'm also going to do the platter. Two bowls, the platter, and the vase. Okay, got glaze in the spray gun. It's a barium blue. And I've adjusted the, <coughs> the gun to give me the texture that I want. Starting on the outside. The rim. Inside.
this one's going to be different. There's textured slip inside the bowl. It's also, you can see a darker clay. The other one was uh, porcelain. This one is real red stoneware. Okay, so here I'm going to want the, this blue heavier around the rim and lighter in the middle. So again, adjust the texture. I've got this dial that controls the shape of the spray down to a circle instead of a fan. I find it easier to control getting it where I want it. And if you can see, I'm actually spraying off the side of the bowl so that just the edge of that spray pattern is actually hitting the rim of the bowl. One thing about spraying, a lot of wasted glaze, even if you use a spray booth. Okay, now I'm gonna fan this out. in the sprayer. I'm going to want the pattern heavier on the top and the bottom above and below the spray pattern. I mean the, uh, above and below the slip. pattern finer, much finer. <coughs> Over the slip. So it's a porcelain slip on top of the real red stoneware.
that's it for the vase. And then the platter, I need to clean this up. Okay, platter. Got a bee here helping me glaze. All right, so I'm gonna put this pad, heavier pattern heavier texture on the bottom of the rim. And here too, I'm gonna to put the heavier texture on the rim, heavier glaze on the rim. And then this too has a slip pattern on the inside. Flatter instead of a circle by turning that dial up. And then I'm going to leave this in one direction here. This one. I'm going to spray everything from this direction. with the, um, the texture from the slip by doing it from one direction, the glaze is thicker on the surfaces facing me and thinner on the surfaces that are away. few days since the last filming over here and the kiln has been fired so this is not the whole kiln mode but this is a group of pots that came out of the kiln Glaze tests. I said I did a bunch of glaze tests, and here are the six that are going to get mixed. These two blues are the same down here, the turquoises. Six that are going to get mixed in larger batches to do some more testing with. Then, as we move down the studio, here is a 36 inch Brent slab roller.
the glaze test there stacked up in the back. These drawers are all filled with different sizes and shapes of texturing. That's, I mean that each drawer has got a different kind of collection, selection. Those were collected by Tony over decades. And there's a uh, wedging table over there. Plaster bat and a plaster bowl that clay gets dried out in. Some clay that just arrived. It's a 110 volt uh, cone six kiln that gets fired occasionally. Then we head here into the throwing room. So in here there are three wheels. There's a locker be here. There's a Shimpo VL Whisper there in the middle with the big platter on it. A uh, Brent over there. Just pull the plastic off the platter. <clears throat> so these are 24 inch, 25 pound platters. There's one there, one up on the shelf. So some pots beginning to show up after the kiln firing. And these shelves, I dreamt up these shelves 40 plus years ago in New Hampshire. So they're two by tens with one by two slats across them uh, at intervals, mostly six inch, but occasionally eight inch, or as you can see down, here at the edge are their four inch. So you can put the shelves in um, at, you can put your shelves, shelves spaced based on the, the height of the box. And when you have taller pots, you just skip, uh, skip a spot. And you get, so you get six inch, 12 inch, 18 inch, whatever, depending on the size of the pots. And the shelves themselves are made out of sheets of plywood cut into nine pieces, so that they're uh, 16 by 32. The pot things get made on these shelves, say hand building outside on the slab roll or whatever, they can get carried in, put on these shelves to dry, to finish, um, carried out on the shelves to glaze. And down here, I think we did the kilns, put these shelves out here. Uh, they're all the same shelves, so the same size shelf goes every place in the studio. Makes it easier to glaze things, carry the shelf, throw it on the, uh, carry the shelf, put it on the rack outside the kiln, take an empty shelf, make pots on it, put it on the shelf, take it out. I mean, anyway, you get the point. All right, this is looking out of the throwing room door down the side of the house where uh, there are shelves by the kilns and the kilns. So I'm going to slowly go down here. Let's see. And here's the main kiln. This is a kiln that's mostly fired to cone 10, but also fired to cone 6. It's a, it's a bell kiln. So this top here is wound down, it's hung on a cable, and it comes down off on the left there, you can see the uh, cable and the, what do you call it, a winch? I guess it's a winch, to raise it and lower it. And it's a downdraft, about 45 cubic feet, stackable. And I'm just started loading up, got three shelf, three layers in there. And then if I go down this way a little bit more, these are cone six glazes on the shelves over there. More pots and shelves here. And this is a small <clears throat> bisque and cone six kiln. 
<clears throat> you can see it's stacking rings. It's a gas kiln with stacking rings. So this is about the height, just three rings, <clears throat> most, most common height for bisking, but sometimes uh, large pieces or a whole lot of pots. I'll get all the rings on there and then it'll be, uh, since the gas is coming in from the bottom, let's say I'm bisking to 06, it'll be a cool 08 up at the top. It's a top with all those rings on it. The top is actually up here. <laughs> it's more than actually about double the height of the kiln as you see it there. So here you can see more of these flexible shelving units that um, you saw in the, in the throwing room. Okay, that's it for the kiln space. Then I do one quick moment here with the kiln. So I finished loading the kiln. You can see cones in that back top right corner sitting up on a 12 inch post. There's a spy hole over on that side. There's a spy hole here on the front near the bottom. There are glaze tests in the kiln for about 10 or 12 glazes. And the one thing about this kiln that I had never seen before is how the burners come in. Sorry about those fingers. So you can see in the back corner or straight across from me, the burner coming toward me. And on the outside over here, you can see this burner coming in that way. So the burners all come in the kiln circularly instead of all from the bottom or from the sides. And that present, presented some problems with getting the kiln to balance. And it's actually these bricks here, these soft bricks that are at 30 degrees here. So the burner comes in here, hits that soft brick at 30 degrees and deflects the kiln or deflects the flames up. And I was given that tip by somebody in LA that I was talking to uh, years and years ago when I worked here with Tony and uh, it worked kiln's fairly even. Before that, it was a good kiln, a good uh, cone and a half, sometimes two cone difference between the top and the bottom. It's a downdraft kiln. All right, tomorrow gets fired. This may be noisy here, but just showing you this kiln, cranking it down. If I said earlier, it's called a bell, bell kiln. I didn't know that until uh, I was talking to Larry Carnes one day and asked him if he knew what kind of a kiln this was, what it was called. I'd never heard of it before. Bell kiln. And there we go. It's down. Flush against that bottom layer of bricks. Ready to go. These are photos of the pots that I glazed in the glazing demo fired. So it's a white underglaze with the blue, yellow underglaze with a blue. That's the clear glaze over the red clay, white underglaze with the blue over red clay, white underglaze with the blue over black mountain. Pots by Chris Brock in the top. This round one here up in the front is mine. Then this Greco-Roman one over here also is Chris Brock. It's 29 inches tall. 
a couple of fountains of mine in the back there.